Hey, welcome back for another episode of the podcast, Porn Brain Rewire. I'm Dr. Trish Lee. Thank you so much for taking time to join me because I am psyched about today's episode. It is called Pushed Into Porn, the three main types of stress that will push you. So we are going to break down, first of all, how porn pulls you in. Just to remind you, it has a pull. So then if you have something that's also pushing you in, you're toast because the push and the pull can be very, very difficult to overcome, especially at the beginning phases of a porn brain rewire. So I'm going to remind you of the pull, number one, and then number two, I'm going to break down the three main types of stressors that will push you in because this is what you have to look out for in the short run and definitely in the long run because these stressors are the ones that people will say to me, I don't know why I relapsed. It came out of the blue. No, it didn't. Something broke down. I'm going to help you figure that out today. Then, of course, the third thing we're going to do is your brain hack strategy on how you can avoid this push. And an important aspect is this is going to be something that is above and beyond those first three stressors. So let's dive in. Okay, number one, we're going to talk about that porn pulls you in. It's designed to do so. And it is what is called a super normal stimulus. Super normal means more than optimal, more than typical, more than normal. I don't love the word normal. You know that. But it is a higher dose of dopamine, the pleasure-seeking neurochemical, and it floods your brain. And especially if you found porn when you were young, your brain wasn't even developed. It didn't have the mechanisms to be able to understand what that supernormal stimulus was, never mind be able to move away from it. We know that when people are young, they have difficulty with self-regulation. That's why kids get upset, don't know how to process their emotions. That's why younger people will tantrum. <clears throat> they haven't exercised and developed the muscle of self-regulation. And that's what we're talking about here. Self-regulation is your ability to go, nope, I'm not going to freak out or nope, I'm not going to watch porn. But when you found porn when you were young, you didn't have that ability and your brain was flooded with this neurochemical dopamine. And we know from the science that your brain calibrated in that moment to need more dopamine to feel the same pleasure that you did that initial time. I like to call that the seeds of addiction. And those seeds were planted. And then when you went back, you watered those seeds of addiction on accident. But in doing so, it's reinforcing the supernormal stimulus, the pull. So every time you watch porn, you're reinforcing that pull into the screen. So that is partially what contributes to urges and cravings and that feeling that you want to go back into porn to feel good. So I also want to remind everybody that what we're talking about here is arousal. Not arousal in the sexual sense, but arousal in the sense of the nervous system. I think we all lose sight of that when we're thinking about sexual arousal, but we know that a system can have optimal arousal in the middle, the green zone, flow, or it can be hyper aroused. And when you're watching porn, your nervous system is hyper aroused. It's getting tons of dopamine. It's on high alert. It's getting this, the threshold for pleasure is raising and you're getting tons of pleasure. Um, it is hyper arousal. That's why we know that a porn habit is one of hypersexuality because your brain gets used to this big, big dose of arousal. So that's also going to get be that feeling of adrenaline when you're doing something that charges you up. It's going to be that wired feeling. I know the, the way that this mostly plays out for me is after I've had lots of meetings in a row, you know, then I'll meet my husband for dinner and I'll be like, brr, 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 and he's like, what is going on? He's like, take a breath. Calm your mind. He was doing it to me the other day, but he was wrong. I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? I'm chill right now. And I wasn't excessively talking either. I think he was having a mind thing. But uh, that is the way that hyper arousal will play out for me is that, you know, when my brain's working fast to answer people's questions and to think about their life situations, 
It takes a while for that to come down. In the worst sense, hyperarousal becomes that brain that never shuts off in the mind. It's you're constantly thinking, you have intrusive thoughts, those voices in your head will not be quiet and it goes on and on. Significant hyperarousal. Hyperarousal leads to anxiety, those feelings of anxiousness, wired, those feelings like you need something to calm you down. In a very worst case scenario, that hyperarousal leads to panic attacks because your nervous system is up there on hyperarousal and it never gets a chance to calm down. So that's part of the pendulum effect in your brain that I talk about. That's that high beta, that excessive, very fast speed that's being used much too much and never given time to recover. Now on the other side of the spectrum or the continuum in terms of arousal in the nervous system is hypoarousal to low of arousal. And you probably know when you hit this point in the porn cycle, that's the point when you're unmotivated, you feel overwhelmed, you cannot focus, you can't put a thought together. That's on the, the back end after you've gone into the screen and you flooded your brain with dopamine. We know it goes into a dopamine deficit state. And before you're feeling anxious again, what'll happen is you'll feel really low. You'll feel depressed. And we know that this hypoarousal state contributes to part of the porn cycle. So that is on the other side of the pendulum effect in the pendulum effect brain pattern. That is the too slow speed. That's too much theta. That's sleep mode. So literally your brain is still in that sleepy mode and it can't get cranking. So when your brain is using both of these speeds simultaneously, you will feel wired and tired. You will feel like you want to go into the screen so that you can get that dose of calming and stimulation, but it's perpetuated by the cycle. So you might have ADHD at the outset, you might have anxiety before you consume porn. Most people can't remember because they're so young. So that's a question I'll ask. Did you struggle with attention? Did you struggle with anxiety before the first time you found porn? Some people know they did. Most people, it's like, no, that came on later because it's part of this cycle. It's caused by this cycle. Arousal is changed when you keep going into the screen. You get stuck in the pendulum effect brain pattern, which is the polar opposite of the optimal brain pattern in the middle, the green zone flow. So clearly part of the solution is bringing you out of this pendulum effect and putting you back into, or maybe for the first time ever, getting into the zone and into flow. So that explains the pull that you feel into the screen. So that's number one. But now let's move on to number two, which is what are those pushes that you might feel? And you might not even be able to discern the difference between the two, but they are different. So here's the three main types of stressors that will push you into the screen. Number one, unconscious. There's unconscious factors. Unconscious means you cannot control them with your conscious mind. They are happening and you can't control them. And we will break that down. You can, but you can't control them in the moment. And I will break that down. Number two is subconscious factors. So subconscious is things that are flying below your radar. You might not be aware of on a daily basis, but they are in fact there. Number three is conscious factors. Those things that you're aware about, but you might not have the courage and the strength, or you've never been empowered to change them. And they too are changeable. So that is what we are going to focus on here. Okay, so we've already covered the pull. Now we're gonna cover the pushes. So number one, in terms of what is going to push you into that screen, what's going to push you is subconscious. I've already told you about it. Wait for it. It is the pendulum effect brain pattern. So I use the tagline, control your brain or it'll control you because that pendulum effect brain pattern is being wired into your brain every single time you consume pornography. And it is keeping that cycle of hyper and then hypo arousal going. So the number one thing that you can do is A, stay out of the screen. It's imperative. 
Two, be able to train your brain closer and closer out of the pendulum effect into that green zone, that flow state using technology. That's why I offer neurofeedback coaching because neurofeedback is a first line of defense when it comes to addiction because addiction comes out of the pendulum effect brain. And so this way, if your brain's keeping you in that mode unconsciously, then you need something unconscious to shift your brain unconsciously into a better mode. So your brain performance pattern is definitely impacted by subconscious and conscious factors, which we're gonna dig into in just a minute. But it's also impacted by this unconscious piece. And that's why I tell you that you can stay out of the screen and unwire your brain a bit, but for most people, rewiring into that optimal mode is necessary because they've used that dysregulated pattern for so long. So let's think about what unconscious means. Unconscious is part of the brain aspects that at our cortical levels, where I usually talk about up at the cortex, the higher areas of the brain, there is easier ability to be able to shift what's going on there using neurofeedback. But then it also then will kind of penetrate down into those midbrain structures and those lower brain structures by pyramidal cells in the brain, but it will travel down to the autonomic nervous system, kind of that limbic brain, that gorilla in the middle of your ship. If you remember that video I made where I talked about the captains up here in the frontal lobe, but there's a, you know, 50,000 pound gorilla in the midbrain, limbic brain, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, old brain dysfunction, where he just wants bananas. So if your gorilla in the midbrain just wants bananas, it's difficult for the captain to do his job. Neurofeedback addresses all of those levels of the brain. And so my point about autonomic nervous system is it controls your breathing. You don't have to think about your breathing. It's automatic. It's unconscious. You don't have to think about your blood flow or your heart pumping your blood. It's unconscious. So there's aspects of this equation that are unconscious. You cannot think yourself out of. You need something that addresses it at an unconscious level for the fastest way to get yourself out of the screen and to stay out. That's why neurofeedback is so important. So if you're interested in technology that will help you, or neurofeed, professional neurofeedback and coaching with me to get you where you're going as fast as possible, go check out my website, drtrishlee.com. Under personal neuro coaching, there's a bunch of tabs there that is going are going to teach you what I'm talking about in terms of using technology to be able to guide your brain back into the optimal mode at an unconscious level, a way you don't have to think about anything. That's the beauty of neurofeedback. I've worked with people on the autistic spectrum for a long time using neurofeedback, helping them get amazing gains. They don't have to think about what they're doing. It regulates their brain and brings their brain out of that autistic spectrum pattern and thus they're able to feel better because we're helping them at an unconscious level. And again, I feel the need to remind you that our brains are self-healing, our bodies are self-healing. If you cut yourself, your body will heal itself, as will your brain. That's the unwiring in the beginning to rewire. But you know if you get a huge gash in your arm, what do you need to help the healing? You need stitches. And I always refer to neurofeedback as the stitches that will help you unconsciously bring your brain back to where you want and need it. Because if you get a big cut and you don't use stitches, then your body will heal itself, but it won't heal itself back to the optimal way that it was before. And now, you know, they have fancy stitches that you don't even have a scar when you get done. So neurofeedback is the stitches that brings your brain pattern so close to optimal, but then I teach you how to keep it there through coaching strategies. And that is very, very important. We use the tech to shift your brain into the optimal mode unconsciously, but then I work on the subconscious and the conscious to help you keep your brain pattern there. And with that, it's a great segue into number two, what are subconscious stressors? Now, 
subconscious stressors, I'm only going to focus on two today, two areas, is that I had just had a thought. I'm sorry. I had a thought. I've got to back up to unconscious for a second and address erectile dysfunction before we move forward. So I apologize for being choppy here, but it's good. At least I didn't forget to talk about it. Is that erectile dysfunction is something that so many people who consume pornography deal with and can't heal. And we know, and I know that when people take Viagra, they don't even get the results that Viagra are supposed to is supposed to be able to give. And it is because their brain is impacted by this pendulum effect, this autonomic nervous system dysfunction so much that the mechanisms in Viagra can't even overcome what's going on in the brain and the body. And I'm excited to say that I'm putting together an erectile dysfunction program where you can understand the mechanisms behind, behind erectile dysfunction and understand what to do to be able to overcome it. But what I want to talk about here quickly in the unconscious section of this podcast is that erectile dysfunction is, is primarily unconscious. And it's definitely affected by the stressors subconscious and conscious, which I'll also address in a second, but it's unconscious. So when your brain is stuck in that pendulum effect for so long, especially at very high levels of hyper and hypo arousal, which those high levels come from frequency, consistency, and especially intensity of porn consumption or sexual acting out behaviors. That's what makes it that your brain gets fried. I know it's not a technical term, but the reward center in the brain is doused in dopamine. So it can't respond to a human being in a sexual experience the way that it does to what you've been consuming in the content. At the same time, it changes the cascades of the neurochemicals, and at the same time, it changes cellular function. And it changes it in a way that if the cellular function breaks down and it's kind of, you know, been on red alert and it's been hyper and hypo aroused, the cell starts to deteriorate and it does not operate in the way that it did when your brain was healthy. We know this, and I made a video on epigenetics, how we can rise above our genetics when it comes to this, but we also can heal this whole cascade of how brain performance falls out and affects many other areas of our body. So we know this, if your brain isn't functioning properly, you'll have more pain. Pain is processed in the brain. So the brain needs to be regulated for pain to be able to go away. And of course, if you have something that you know, is hurt from repetitive motion, you have to stop the repetitive motion. When it comes to erectile dysfunction, we have to heal the brain so that all those cascading effects down to the cells can become healed. And then when your cells are healed and they're firing properly in the proper way, and they're using all of the hormones and the chemicals in the body, then you won't struggle with erectile dysfunction anymore. So it's actually very complex. And Viagra becomes the band-aid, but neurofeedback becomes the stitches. And that's the reality. Your brain needs stitches to be able to heal itself. And then there's other things you can do, which I'm putting together, to be able to boost the whole system so that it's working properly again. But it starts in the brain. Okay, erectile dysfunction unconscious primarily, and then we'll talk about how it gets perpetuated through subconscious and conscious. But now let's go on to number two, subconscious. So there's two main, main things that I consider to be subconscious factors. Number one is your programming from the past, which I think is mind-blowing when you realize you're programmed by your parents, by your family, by your culture, by your community, by your church, by your schools, by your responses to all those things, you're programmed. We all have programming, just like computer systems that we're running off of. And I'm always finding new ways that my programming plays out. And literally I question myself at all times these days because the things that I say and I believe and I need for myself are just based on the programming I got from my parents who I would not consider the happiest, healthiest people in the world. God love them and I love them too. But, you know, I am looking for a new outcome, which means I need to change my programming, which I've been doing my whole life, which makes me the black sheep, proudly. 
but I'm going to continue to do it. So something that I've talked about before, but just reoccurred to me during this whole moldy chaos is that I have been conditioned to keep my life at very high chaos levels and then to deal with the very high chaos and ch be a champion of someone who is strong and can handle all the chaos. What I did not ever really see modeled and I didn't learn to do was being someone who can relax and be at peace and not need chaos in their world. And if you just think about it logically, I'm from a family of six kids, three boys and three girls. I married my my hubs, my PIC, who is also from an Irish family of three boys and three girls. So we both grew up in this chaos of survival of the fittest in a family of six kids. There's no way a parent of, with of kids of six kids can give each kid the attention that they would want to. So I experienced that in my own life and I have actually tried very, very hard. I've probably swung in the opposite direction to be able to give my kids, te to teach them and to help them to learn and to guide them into adulthood. So I've changed my programming with that, but I'm still that strong person who at the end of the day is completely exhausted and depleted because I've given to my unregulated children and they're not dysregulated, they're unregulated. We already covered this. When you're a child, you're unregulated. You haven't built the skill yet. So my job as a mom is to help them build that skill. But sometimes I probably have gone over um, and above priding myself on being a good mom. But some of the times I've probably taken away their opportunities to figure it out themselves because I wanted to help them avoid hurt and discomfort like I felt when I was young. I felt like nobody heard me, nobody saw me, nobody helped me through feelings and emotions. We never talked about them. So now if anything goes down, I want to explore feelings, talk about how you're thinking, probably too much. And I've scaled that back in the last year. And it's been difficult for me because like my son went to college, today's his birthday, he's 19, which is a wonderful thing. But he went to college and he had a lot of roommate difficulties. Um, you know, he had a bunch, he had class issues, regular go to college stuff, which nobody gave two craps about when I went to college. There was nobody there like, hey Trish, how you, how you feeling about your new roommate? You know, none of that. But anyways, he was struggling and he called me and I talked to him for a little while. And then I said, you know what, babe? Uh, anyway, I think we, I think we're beating a dead horse now. I'm gonna let you go. And hopefully you feel better in the morning. And then I sent him a text, you know, that I love him. I hope he rocks out a great day. And then he figured it all out himself. He told me about it a little bit of, along the way as he was figuring it out. But how amazing for him to have that opportunity instead of me swooping in full Karen, which I wanted to, go to that school and go, I need you to take care of this situation for my precious son. I didn't. And it was hard. It actually took a lot of strength not to go and try to help him. It took strength to not talk to him about it because I was letting him move through it. And that man is stronger for it. I've been doing that with my daughter who is one year younger than him. She's figuring out boyfriend stuff. She's figuring out how to manage her finances, which is challenging for her. Declan never had an issue with that. So I'm teaching her and I'm letting her go succeed and not so much succeed. And we, we, we got into it the other day because she called me so I could float her some money. And I'm like, I can't, babe, we're working on this. She was mad at me for an entire day. But I'm like, you know what? I'm here to teach her not to be her best friend who keeps sabotaging her growth. So I stayed in peace and she called me back the next day and told me, thank you for letting her move through that because she got the opportunity to figure it, figure it out herself. So programming, question everything you believe. When you go to default in a certain way, think if it's leading you towards the outcome because the, you know, I won't say smothering, but, you know, responding too much to my kids' needs, which was the swinging really far from what I got when I was a kid, that wasn't good for them or me. It exhausted me. So I had to swing myself back from that. So, you know, I did question my programming in the past, but then I went too far in the opposite direction, which led me to question it again, which has brought me back. 
constantly questioning your belief systems and realizing you probably didn't build a lot of them yourself. But what it does is it gives you the opportunity to start building your own belief system and and anchoring into it like an anchor in the storm, no matter what other people think. So my thought system now is very different from my family's thought system, my parents and my siblings. And, you know, they don't love my thought system, but that's okay because my thought system is bringing me to where I want to go. And so it's important that I live my life based on my beliefs and the way I want to navigate the world. But I can only establish those when every time I question something, I can create a new way of interacting with people and a new way of respecting myself. So whatever isn't working for you from the past, figure it out. You can either write it in your journal right now, or more importantly, as moments come to you that you're not loving, then figure it out in those moments. Take the time to go, you know what? I need a few minutes to figure this out. Or, you know, I need a break from this conversation. Um, one more thing that happened with my hubs, he never watches my videos, which gives me liberty to talk about his experiences, which I know he'll be okay. He and Fiona, because of this, oh, my, my middle daughter, um, because of this financial situation, she was kind of yelling at him, I guess. He says she was yelling at her. She says he yelled at her first. Who knows? But I know she yells. So I'm sure she was yelling at him. And then he responded by yelling back. And I talked to them both later on. And he goes, you know what? If she's going to yell at me, I'm going to yell back. And I said, not necessarily, babe. That's not how parenting works. Thankfully, he was open to the, you know, suggestion in the moment. But he realized, you know what? That's how he grew up. That's not what he wants. And he's been working on that a lot with the kids. He, he hardly ever yells. When they were younger, he would yell more because it was just his default mode. That's what he learned. That if a kid does something, the parent has the right to scream at them. And I did not grow up with that. So that is not a rule that I was having in our family. I'm like, you are not to yell at the kids. Um, you know, and of course, sometimes we get dysregulated and we yell. And if we do, then we apologize, which he did apologize to her and they made up. But the point is like that rule, if you get yelled at, I'm going to yell back. That's just programming. Question that because yelling back, if someone attacks you and you attack them back, what do they do? They push harder, negative feedback loop. So I won't even go there. I will escape before I let myself get wrapped up in that. I'll say, I can't do this anymore. I'm out of here. And then when I come back, I can deal with it. And the other person is regulated also, unless it's one of my precious children, then I have to go back and help them regulate. You get the point, subconscious. Okay, the second aspect of subconscious is the stuff that's running in your background that you've convinced yourself is not bothering you. So I've also learned this about the example I gave about my programming is that I realized that constantly giving to my kids, even though I prided myself on it, I felt like it was depleting me. And actually, I think it was creating like some micro resentment to myself. Like, like, why are you giving them your stuff? You know, because if my kids wanted anything, literally, I would exercise this idea of non-attachment, which is important to me not to get attached to worldly belongings because it's just stuff. But at the same time, you know, to have respect within a relationship, there has to be boundaries. So like, you know, in the past, my kids would just go into my closet and take stuff that they wanted. And I've had to lay more boundaries like, no, you cannot take that. No, you can't. You can't wear that today or you can't use that. And, and I don't, I pride myself on not using the word mine. You know, you'll never hear me say that's mine, but I will say, you know, I, I am not going to be doing that. Another thing my kids will say is, you know, you have plenty of money. Like, can't I have a $300, you know, this just because I earn money, that doesn't mean I have to give it all to you. And in the past, I'd be like, mm, I've got the money to buy that kid that thing. Why shouldn't I? but it's about boundaries and respect. And when I honor myself by doing what feels good to me, then I decrease those micro resentments and I'm a better person for it. So figure out things that are running in your background. There was another time which 
I had, you know, a thing going between me and someone else and it was just eating my mind alive. Every, I, I realized it, every time I was in the car, I would just think about this thing. And I, you know, this was a long time ago, I think I shared this story before where I'm like, I said to my husband, I've got to get on a plane and go make this person talk to me, even though the person refused. And I didn't do anything. I just needed to like not have a thing out there with someone. And I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't make that person resolve it. I still can't. It's still out there. And it's a person who I'm intimate. I should be intimately connected to, but you know, I can't make a person come back and figure something out with me. All I can do is extend love to that person. And when I figured out my role in how I was perpetuating the feelings I had, I was able to release myself from that. So ultimately, that thing was literally torturing me in the background, but I didn't even realize it. I'm like, I got this, I got this. And then after I realized, you know what, this thing's really bothering me, I had to get, get to a place of forgiveness to myself for the part I played and the forgiveness that to the person for the part they played. And then I had to exercise the muscle of, you know, unconditional love for people who aren't treating me with respect. If someone doesn't treat you with respect, it's because of them, not because of you. You can only give what you have. So if you are in the dumps, <coughs> excuse me, if you're using the pendulum effect brain and you're angry and you're irritable, you can only give what you have. When you give your brain that push, that training into the optimal mode, then you can give love. Love and joy and peace come out of the optimal brain performance pattern. That's the truth. When you're filled with love, you just give other people love. They can't do you wrong. And that's an amazing thing when nothing will run in your background because your brain's in the optimal mode. Then you're able to put that thing at peace and be at peace with someone having conflict with you because you can't control other people. You can only control your responses. We all think life exists outside of ourselves, and the world exists outside of ourselves. Life happens within us, within our responses and how we feel. Our life is how we feel about the world around us, which can be shifted by unconsciously shifting your brain into a better mode and then figuring out what's going on, flying under the radar in subconscious and doing what you need to do to get to a place of peace. All right, number three is conscious. Conscious is take your journal out and write down all of your stressors. Write them down. Get them all up. Put them all on paper and then start ticking them off the list. Figure out ways to reduce and eliminate. You'll never get rid of all your stress, but you can definitely change your schedule to give yourself little breaks between appointments so you're not running late all the time. That's a huge one that's just gonna give you more peace and joy. It's gonna keep your brain out of that pendulum effect, a busy schedule, or getting behind on projects. Get a planner and use executive function skills, which might be tricky at this point because of porn, but start doing the small little things that lead you to success and you're gonna feel great about it. Stop putting things off, don't ignore things. When you ignore things, they fester. When you deal with them right away, you feel great. Figure out what your stressors are. If your relationship is suffering, communication is the number one thing to improve your relationship. Get to talking about it in a healthy way, which of course is going to require you to unconsciously rewire your brain so that you can show up in those conversations and not let conflict escalate. You can deal with the conflict that's real and get to solution, resolution, so figure out what those conscious stressors, stressors are and try to do as much as you can to reduce them. And put in healthy stress management like workouts, like punching your boxing dummy. I haven't been able to punch my boxing dummy in months and I've not made it to the boxing club because I've moved farther away from it now. Um, but I've been outside doing kickboxing moves. I'm in the park. I'm sure my neighborhood thinks I'm an absolute nut job, but... I don't care, that's the way that it goes. I'm out there working out, doing jumping jacks, doing push-ups, doing vinyasas, doing kicking, doing punching. I have a whole workout routine that I will do in public now because that's how I roll. Uh, so all of that offsets stress. I'm getting rid of all that fast, extra fast speed in my brain and getting myself back every single day to the optimal mode. 
figure out your conscious stressors. And then like I was talking about with my precious children who literally blow up my phone all the time with things that they want help regulating, I used to answer the phone right away. And the kids don't know this. So kids, if you're, if you're listening or watching, I've stopped answering the phone on purpose to give you more time to figure it out because you're all teenagers now. And then I will respond with a text that says, give me a little bit more information so I can think about it so I can help you. That helps them to think about it. And by the time I talk, they've basically gotten to solution. I've changed that so I'm not on red alert with all my kids' problems all the time. It's a game changer consciously in how much stress there is in my life because I'm not buying into the drama. I'm helping them figure it out. Figure out how you can do these things in your life and make sure you're connecting with people. You know how I feel. You got to get on purpose in your life. When your brain is optimized, you will want to go to work. You need meaning. You need to contribute in a really powerful way. That's what brings your power back and it puts you in your grandeur. It takes you out of self-deprivation and grandiosity. Those are the two extremes. Grandiosity is you need a ton of pleasure to feel okay. Self-deprivation is that low, low. Let's get you to grandeur where you take up your space in the world like you were meant to and you rock it out. Chanel, my best friend, I saw her yesterday at the new little house that we are closing on while our actual house is being um repaired still we'll see what happens there uh let the universe guide me but i saw her and she looked gorgeous i texted her later on that night and as she's walking towards me i'm like that's a sister who's owning her power and her space in the world she doesn't need to take up extra space and steal it from other people but she's not slinking around she was perfectly powerful and i wanted to make sure she knew it so i told her later on and that's amazing. When you watch someone take up their exact space in the world, that's power. That's grandeur. That's what I want for you. So let's figure this stuff out. Okay, now here's your brain hack on how you're going to rise above these three stressors and you're going to be able to overcome the pull of the super normal stimulus of porn and you're going to be able to offset all the pushing from the world because you're going to focus in on your life that's inside of you and your responses to the world. And this is how you're going to do it. Are you ready for it? First of all, you've got to do stressors one, two, and three. Unconscious, subconscious, conscious. That's going to get you really far. That's the main point here. But then there's super conscious. Super conscious is tapping into the energy force of your life, not the world. The world will drain your action. When you tap into unlimited energy, you didn't make yourself. You were created by the energy force that is here as life in the world. And I'm calling it super consciousness. And super consciousness is a level of spirituality. But before you click off is that it's not religious, it's not dogma, it doesn't have rules, except for it is part of your creation and you are part of it. It gives you the energy you need to be able to regulate super consciousness. So if you're going to overcome a super normal stimulus, there needs to be a piece of super consciousness. You're not depending on your own energy because that would be ego. Ego is when you're depending on all your brilliant worldly ideas to get you out of this. When you tap into super consciousness, that's your true self. Your true self knows who you are and who you want to be. And, you know, I call it the force. I'm one with the force. The force is with me. And obviously I call it the universe a lot. But it's God. It's divinity. It's Allah. It's Buddha. It's Yahweh. It's the trees that I used to have behind me and hopefully we'll have some version of sometime soon. The trees behind me in my old office, there's a root system in all trees that connects them. And that's why when trees will communicate with each other under the ground, that is Schumann's resonance that helps energy to be able to flow through the earth, that grounding energy that sets you back into a place of amazement and wonder and being on purpose. 
the, the butterfly effect, not chasing the butterfly like we talk about with porn, but the butterfly effect. If the a butterfly flaps its wings in the South Pole, it it changes the wind current all the way to the North Pole. We're all connected here. It's the collective consciousness. That's why I call it a positive ripple effect of change. Because if you leave porn behind, it's going to change you on the inside. It's going to change your interactions with your partner for sure, with your children, with your friends, with your parents, with your work, with your hobbies. And it's gonna create this ripple effect. So you're not in this alone. You have to tap into that. That's what super consciousness is. When you're your true authentic self, you're empowering other people to do that also. It's the ripple effect of change, my friend. That's what we are here for and that's what we are about. Okay, a little bit longer podcast today, but thank you for staying with me to the end. So get that journal out, do the work that you need to, to overcome the pull, forget the push of the unconscious, regulate your brain, use technology to do it. It's there for you. Go to my website, drtrishley.com, personal neuro coaching, check things out. Subconscious, figure out that programming and the junk that's running in the background. Do what you need you need to do to change it. Conscious, make a list of all your stressors and find ways to reduce and alleviate them, getting your stress back in check and then offset that stress that you do have. Then tap into super consciousness in a way that's important to you. If you like to go to church, go to church. If you like to have dinner with your friends and feel that connectedness on Friday night, do that. If you have a meditation habit, which I completely support and I do, I have my quiet time and meditation. I'm always reading things that feed my super consciousness so I can stay connected to you. That's why I'm here because I know I'm not alone in this world. I'm here to heal myself and to help others heal themselves. That's your power too. All right, I hope this helps you out and go to my website, drtrishley.com. Get into the 90-day program. It's a really great first start if you're struggling with pornography. You get a free coaching call. There's group support if you need it. It gets you on your way with the tools, techniques, and strategies to overcome the pushes and pulls of porn. Go to the personal neuro coaching page. Check out the headband that can help regulate your brain unconsciously. And as always, control your brain or it will control you.